Defending Israel with David Harris on JBS is made possible in part by a generous gift in memory of Eric and Mira J. Spector, the Paul and Lynn Late Family Foundation to Life to Love, Barbara and Bob Goodkind, the Patricia Worthen Ullman Foundation, Hello JBS viewers, I'm David Harris. Welcome to Defending Israel. We have another very special guest that I'd like to introduce you to today. His name is Lawai Al-Sharif. He's speaking to us from Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. If you don't already know him, if you're not one of the 205,000 followers of his on X or Twitter, uh, as I still prefer to call it, uh, you should know that above all, uh, I consider him one of the leading advocates for the pursuit of peace and coexistence in the Middle East. And in that part of the world, to be such an advocate requires extraordinary courage and determination. Lowai, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. I'm so honored and privileged to be here. And um, yeah, as, as you said, we're all looking for um, fostering a greater peace in the Middle East, and inshallah, it, uh, it may happen in our lifetime. Well, in fact, I wanted to open, if I may, by asking you, since the events of October the 7th, have you become more or less optimistic about the prospects for building that new Middle East, which included the Abraham Accords, including your own country, the UAE? How do you feel today? I, I, How do you feel now? I am, I am um, unlike what many people might, might think, I am very optimistic because I believe that this war that is happening right now, which is an ugly war, a war that was started by Hamas on October 7th when it attacked Israel and killed 1,200 uh, innocent people, m mainly or mostly were civilians from the Supernova Music Festival and others uh, in the Kibbutzim as well. Uh, this war that is taking place right now, I have a great optimism that it will be the final war, the last war in the region. Unfortunately, uh, President Sadat of Egypt, he wished that uh, Yom Kippur war to be the final war when he gave a speech in the Knesset and he said, let, this war, let, this, uh, let there be no more wars between Arabs and Israelis in his famous speech. Unfortunately, some wars happened. Uh, some escalation, but this war, I have a great optimism it will be the last war. I'll tell you why, David, because I believe that the Arab world and the West and many people who are unfamiliar with radical Islamists like Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Islamic Jihad and others, they saw the real face of how these people would make the countries or the states or even the cities that they would rule look like. I believe now no one has a trust in in any Islamist or Muslim Brotherhood uh, organization like Hamas to be a ruler again. Now we've seen what they've done to Gaza in the past 17 years. They never brought prosperity to the people of Gaza. They invested the money, the billions that they received in building tunnels and in uh, emphasizing their in, uh, their infrastructure and they they didn't do well so i have great optimism that now everyone sees the the true face of these organizations and no one would ever support them um uh to rule again so this is my optimism so i, I it, it's wonderful to hear your optimism but let me let me challenge it for a moment if i may gently some say Iran is feeling stronger, uh, more muscular than ever before. It's not being challenged. And one has to look at Iran as, as the head of the snake. Hezbollah, Hamas, and others are tentacles of the snake on the one hand. And on the other hand, look at the streets of London. Look at the American campuses. Look at how many people have bought the Hamas na narrative, or so it seems. You see it differently? 
Yes, I see it differently. I'll tell you. First of all, I recognize all of these challenges, as you said. I've been speaking in uh, American campuses in the past few months. After October 7th, I was so active. I've toured many U.S. campuses with my Arab, uh, my fellow Arab peace activists. So we know exactly what what is happening. But uh, I I claim, David, that uh, people like like uh, like me and the Arab peace activists, we know the issue very well. We know it very well, more far better than those in Europe or in America or those who don't really understand who they're supporting. I'm talking about those pro Hamas supporters on US campuses. So because we know the problem, we have the cure. First of all, I believe that we can defeat Iran. We can defeat Iran non-militarily. We can defeat Iran by expanding the Abraham Accords, by having more peace in the region. And for this to happen, we need a strong America. We need a strong America that really believes in this cause. And I'll be very honest with you, David, when the Abraham Accords took place in 2020, um, it was the it was late 2020, and the current America administration, I always say that, picked it up but didn't build it up. It picked it up but it didn't make it go anywhere. So if we have a strong America that believes in making the Abraham Accords great again, we can defeat we can defeat evil ideologies, and we can defeat uh, Iran and its proxies that uh, love to destabilize the region. You know, if Iran wanted to uh, to thrive the region or to bring prosperity or to end the hate, no one would have a, a disagreement with it. But, but Iran really seeks to uh, destabilize the region, to annihilate Israel, to uh, to uh, propagate enmity against the Jewish people and against other, other sects as well, what, what, what people do not know. So uh, we ha it's a battle that we need to, uh, to encounter. But if we have a strong America that really believes in, in this peace, we will prevail, inshallah. But I, I, I recognize and I, uh, I agree with you on all the challenges that we have, whether they're on campuses or in the West, especially in UK, which many people call, by the way, Londonistan because uh, they are dealing with people who are misusing the freedom uh, in a way that they would use it as a ladder to climb and reach their destination. Once, once they do, they will throw the ladder away. Unfortunately, not so many people in the West understand that. So, Loai, you're, you're actually a graduate of an American university, which, by the way, viewers helps explain um, his brilliant accent. Uh, Penn State, I think, uh, is your alma mater. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so you know something about the American campus mentality. How do you explain this surge of support for a group that you yourself have said is medieval, anti-peace, pro-war, pro-terrorism? How do you explain it? And what, what should the West be doing about those campuses and those street marches every Saturday in London and all the rest. How do you, res how do you, how do you respond to these things? The lack of understanding. The American people in general are very kind people, amazing people. I lived with the Americans and I know how they are, how they are so good deep down. So when they see images from uh, Gaza or when they, when, when they see Hamas uh, uh, portraits themselves as uh freedom fighters they would buy it they would think well there is an occupation and if there is an occupation then uh resisting that occupation is legal what they don't know now this this comes in the propaganda that i call uh, a masquerade a, a propaganda that comes in disguise uh, a camouflage that uh, if i would say so no not so many americans know the real geopolitics or the uh uh, the situation on the ground. Um, so when you explain things to them, they start to get like uh, more and more uh, knowledgeable. And this is why David, um, voices from the region who be, uh, that believe in peace, Arab peace activists that belie believe in peace, we are the best people to explain to the Americans who are uh, carried away by the propaganda of Hamas and the and the, and the, and the so-called occupation would 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 clear things um, to them. So, for example, I've spoken to many Americans who thought, well, well, Israel is occupying Gaza, which is not true. Not, I'm not talking about the current situation, of course, but Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza in the summer of 2005. And Ariel Sharon did this as a gesture of good faith to give the Palestinians part of the land that they were calling for. Isn't the, that part of the 1967 um, 
uh, territories that the Palestinians are demanding, or at least, of course, not the, not all the Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority that is demanding Gaza and the West Bank. So Gaza was given fully to the Palestinians from 2005. There was no Israeli soldier uh, um, set foot on that soil. And they didn't turn Gaza into the place it deserved to be, a Singapore or a Dubai. While it had great funding, uh, Gaza had great funding from Arab world, from many Arab um, moderate states. But unfortunately, that, that was not the case. So when, when, I, when I meet Americans who say, well, Gaza is occupied or there is an like occupation, that is not true. Or when they say Israel is an apartheid, uh, apartheid and then you tell them that there are two million arab israeli muslims and by the way this is what, what one of the reasons why i changed my views on israel um, um, um like like years ago uh david I, I i was not brought up with a positive idea about israel or about the jewish people so when you uh when you meet people from israel and they tell you we are arabs and muslims citizens of the jewish state this might sound a bit confusing, but this is the fact. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the propaganda, back to your question, the propaganda that is ma that is camouflaged with, uh, with, uh, with falsehood is the reason why so many people are deceived. And because the American people are good people and they don't want to see people suffering, so it's, it's easy for them to be deceived by this propaganda. A very helpful answer. I hope many people are listening to you right now. Is the conflict with the Palestinians as you see it today, is it about 1947, the very existence of the state of Israel? Or is it about 1967 and the possibilities of working out a two-state agreement? Which is it? It's about, it's about, um, it's about year 1000 BC. <laughs> Explain. So I'll be very blunt and honest. The biggest misinformation that would be... Um, would need our attention in order to move things forward is describing the Jews as foreign colonialists in their ancestral homeland. So in my uh, professional opinion, I would say, following the, uh, the, uh, the different point of views in the Arab world, the idea is not 1948 or 1967. The idea is the rejection of the, the Jewish people to be uh, uh, so sovereign on their ancestral homeland. This is why I told you 1000 BCE because King David was the second king of Israel that established the kingdom. And that was the real the real founder, if I may say, because he was the one who proclaimed Jerusalem as the capital of, of the kingdom of Israel. It was Hebron before that. And this is the irony, David. You have many Muslims, my fellow Muslims, who believe, honor, revere prophets and kings of Israel named after them without making these kind of connections that the Jewish people belong to this region, belong to this land, are not foreign colonialists. The word Jew itself, by the way, was never used um, uh, before 5, 5, uh, 586 BCE to identify a, the group that was called the Israelites. But they were called the Jews because when they were exiled to Babylonia, the Babylonians asked them, where you guys are coming from? They said, we come from a land called Judah. We are the Jews. If the majority of the Israelites were taken away from the portion of the land that was called Binyamin, you would be now called Binyaminites. So the word itself, Jew, defies anyone who would say that the Jews are not indigenous to the land of Israel. Because the word itself says, I am a Judean, I am Judah, I am I am." Uh, this, uh, the, the child of this land, which is now called, by the way, the West Bank. This is why the, the Israelis are still calling it Yehuda Shimron. And why is it called Judah? Because a character that is revered, honored, and respected in Islam and Judaism, Joshua bin Nun, when he entered the land, he partitioned it into 12 sectors, and that sector was called Judah. So you see what I'm saying, uh, uh, David, that the biggest misinformation is describing the Jews as, as conquerors on their ancestral homeland, a homeland that your ancestors and many of, of, of other Jewish ancestors lived in. And we as Muslims honor, revere, and respect. We respect and honor Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, Solomon, Habakkuk, 
and Daniel, many Muslims now are named Daniel in Saudi Arabia without making the connection that the name itself is Hebrew, it means God judges, and this, this prophet is from the line of Judah who was living in exile. I don't want to give a, a, a history <laughs> lesson, David, but I'm just saying this is very important in understanding the the uh, the dynamics and, and in, in, in understanding facts related to why Israel is there, because Israel has always been there. But the fact that Jews are sovereign on their national state or on their national uh, uh, homeland is an idea that that doesn't fit with the narrative that looks and views Jews and Christians as always subjugated. So this is the real problem with those who refuse the existence of Israel. It's, it was never borders with Israel. It was never about borders or uh, uh, which year is it, 1948, 1967. It's about the existence of Israel itself. And this is this is a problem that we need to solve if we if we really want to solve issues. I, I don't want to throw some diplomacy and tell you what what you hear in the Arab world or what you hear in the in the media by being so diplomatic. No, I just want to say the truth that this is a problem that we need to solve before we move things forward. I can only hope that millions of people will hear that answer that you just gave. Uh, what a probing, powerful answer it is. I want to come back to something else you said a few moments ago. I don't want to lose that thread. You, you spoke about America's role in the region. And if I heard you correctly, you expressed some disappointment with the current administration, feeling that they've not been active enough in picking up the, the Abraham Accords possibilities. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Uh, the, the current administration would say, we tried really hard we got very close with Saudi Arabia, and then came October 7th, which probably originated in Iran, trying to disrupt a deal with Saudi Arabia. But don't we deserve more credit than we're getting for trying? Tell us what you think. I'll tell you what I honestly think. Uh, yes, I believe there is, uh, there is a problem with the current administration in picking up the Abraham Accords, because if you, if you recall very well, David, when the current administration picked it up, they, they changed the name in the beginning. Of course, they then revert to Abraham Accord, but they, they first called it normalization deals. And I understand that there is some sort of, uh, uh, of, of competition between the Democrats and the Republicans and considering the Abraham Accord, Accords as an achievement by the Republicans, but it, it, should, it should go beyond that. So they then called it the Abraham Accords uh, after we're calling it uh, the normalization deals. And, and I don't re really believe that it was given that much of a push. Uh, relation with Saudi Arabia started in a very gray area when President Biden, before he even became president, he promised to make the Saudis and Saudi Arabia as the pariah. And of course, things did not really move this way. Things moved uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way. But no, I, I, I believe the Americans could have done um, a lot to benefit the Abraham Accords. And allow me to say this, David, um uh, I'm very selfish when it comes to the Abraham Accords because I personally believe that many of America's problems will go away if we have a stable Middle East. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I believe that if 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 um, true genuine peace, not security agreement peace like the one we had with Jordan and like we have between Egypt and Israel or Jordan and Israel, I call it the security agreement peace. We don't want the security agreement peace. We want a peace where people to people enjoy the benefits of peace, where you see thousands of flights travel between Tel Aviv and Abu Dhabi and Dubai, where you see the people are emerging, getting to know each other, spending Shabbats together, uh, greeting each other when Ramadan comes. So this is what, what I call what I call people to people peace. If if this was supported and and expanded, many, many of America's problems would Will, will go away. Imagine a region where Israel is fully integrated, where Muslims and Jews, Arabs and Israelis do, do not live in the enmity that their enemies wanted them to live in. Imagine how our region would look like, thrive, prosperous, uh, energetic, and this would have a great reflection on America. But the current administration, I, uh, I, I, I've, I've met many people, by the way, who are officials, and I told them that in the face, I really understand and respect what President Biden is doing, but of course it is not enough, and not enough push was 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 done to expand at least 
the Abraham Accords and to stop those who want to disrupt it because Hamas wanted to disrupt the Abraham Accords. I, I, and, and by the way, in the Arab media, they don't call it the, the Abraham, the Ittifaqiyat Ibrahim, they call it Ittifaqiyat Abraham. So it's like they are referring to someone else who is not, they don't want to call it with the name Ibrahim. And I believe that what, what the former administration did was the greatest thing that they called the name Abraham to this uh, or to these accords to give it a blessing. And inshallah, I'm so optimistic that if if uh, if things change this November, I believe the Abraham Accords will thrive and our Middle East will uh, will be uh, in, in a better shape. So let's see what happens, of course. But in the meantime, tell us what's the secret sauce, if you will, of the UAE, your country, and if I may add Bahrain, a neighboring country, in which both countries not only signed the normalization deal, but they embraced it. And as you said, it wasn't just at the top, it was at the street level, it was in the flights, it was in the exchanges. What, what's the secret sauce of the UAE, and if you wish, Bahrain as well, to explain this yearning for true peace? The secret of the UAE, I would say, is the wise leadership. The leadership that really embraces uh, the values they call for, the values of peace, tolerance, and coexistence. So it's not just um, calling for values without applying them. When you come, by the way, David, and I, I, I'm so sure that you came before to Abu Dhabi and Dubai, you would see things on the ground um, uh, as a reflection of this of this kind of belief system by the leadership. So you have the Abrahamic family house where you see a synagogue next to a mosque, next to a church. You see Sheikh Zayed Mosque welcomes people from different faiths, different religions. I've, I've, I've met many Israelis who told me um, when they came to the to the Abu Dhabi that uh, going to a mosque is not something that they prefer because they grow up in, in areas where the word mosque is very, how to say this, uh, very uh, um, hostile, but, but, but the, the Sheikh Zayed Mosque changed this perspective. And when you see uh, laws that respect religious freedom and laws that would... Um, that would never tolerate with those who are extremists or or intolerant. This is the the the, the secret recipe, uh, and then you see it on on the ground by uh, laws that would uh, would would fight hate speech. And I hope that you have this in the West, uh, David. I know many people in America. They say, "Look, I, freedom of speech is 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 like taking away our God." And I'm not asking the Americans or the Europeans or the legislators to change freedom of speech. I, totally understand that but there's a difference david between freedom of speech and incitement and if if the legislators were educated and and uh, uh, educated enough about, about not not in, not not fully uneducated but educated enough about what's what's what, what the slogans really mean uh, they would ban a slogan like from the river to the sea because it's a slogan that calls for a genocide and i believe it was banned or it is banned in some countries by the way and uh, or or other other slogans that really have uh, an incitement uh, nature so thank god uh, the uae is a monarchy is not is not a, a democracy yes we acknowledge that but the leaders are taking the country to um, a better future and, and it works. You see many people, 200 plus nationalities live in this country and they don't want to leave because now the UAE uh, is, is, is giving everyone equal opportunity. You have, the, you have the golden visa, which is very similar to the green card, a 10 year residency. People are investing, are growing, are, 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 are living without a fear. And this prototype is, is working so good. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, David, one more thing, the UAE has uh, an application of Islam, I would say, the mod the true moderate Islam that is, um, in a way, a silence reform of, of of radicalization and extremism, a silent reform. It's a reform of of so many ideas that are rejected, but doesn't have to be um, publicly announced. But but you see it on the ground, and you see it in the legislations and the, the, the regulations. So this is the secret recipe. But of course, if the leadership did not believe in these values, you would never see them on the ground. And I can, I can attest personally, having been to the UAE more than once, there is actually a growing Jewish community there of expatriates from all over the world who are coming, who are living more openly as Jews than ever before. The Abrahamic family houses uh, is a statement. 
uh, teaching about the Holocaust, which yes. is, is absent elsewhere in the Arab world. And one more thing that, that I noticed, um, there was a recent graduation in the UAE where one of the students yelled free Palestine um, from the stage during the graduation ceremony and he was expelled. In the United States, the students who, who chanted free Palestine at graduation, I think suffered no consequences. So quite different, which brings me to another question. We only have a couple of minutes left, unfortunately. But you spoke about freedom of speech versus incitement. There have been some discussion in the United States about whether the Muslim Brotherhood itself should be banned in the United States. It is not, uh, as far as I know, banned in the United States today. Should it be? Of course, absolutely. Bien sûr, barour. <laughs> every, language, every language under the sun here. <laughs> every language, of course, because these... Let me tell you one thing, David. There is a difference between Islam and Islamism. I'll give it to you in a very short term. Islam as a faith where you practice your prayers, fast Ramadan, no one would have an issue with that. Politicizing Islam and making it into a proselytizing dogma that would force its beliefs on people and change the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics of a society has to be viewed as a threat. And the masters of Islamism and radical Islamism are the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, you have other movements as well. So the thing is that people in the West and in America, they are not aware of, of what's really happening because these people are using the freedom, the freedoms that they are granted by the countries that host them. They are using the same uh, tactics, but, uh, but trust me, trust our region. Once they get what they want, they will throw this freedom under the bus and they will absolutely throw away the ladder and they will ch and they will proselytize the uh, the the society and they will spout and spread hate enormous abundance of hate that they have in their chests and this will bring many societies down and we've seen we've seen similar cases to uh well, when the muslim brotherhood ruled what they brought to the societies so uh, it it should be banned the Americans should be aware of the tactical, uh, openly evasive methods of these groups. And, uh, and I'm so happy, I'm proud that the UAE, Saudi Arabia and many moderate Muslim states banned this, uh, this group because it's really lethal and dangerous. Uh, and in our really closing minute or two, if I can ask you quickly, you referred to London earlier as London Stan. Is it too late for a country like the UK to recover from what's happened, or is there it's still time? It's never too late if you have the uh, um, the right mentalities that understand uh, what's beyond what they see with their own eyes. Uh, it's never too late, but of course, it's it's becoming more and more challenging. It's becoming more and more challenging. I've been to London twice the past three months, and I've seen things that were unbelievable but it's never too late if you have the right mentalities and if you have a will if there's a will there's a way but there are things permitted in britain that are not permitted in the uae is that correct yeah so when things for example are, are uh, the protests protests are not allowed in the uae and i'm so happy with that and many people who are who know very well that protests that would lead to violence and most probably they would we know our region very well and uh, and and this would would cause instability when you have people intimidating others in a graduation ceremony and this intimidation lead to other problems so it should be it should be banned not because of the uh, not because there is something against the palestinians but because of the intimidation that uh, and the and the free uh, the palestine and pro hamas supporters are the masters of intimidation when it comes to intimidation be honest with you not the palestinian people not the regular palestinians who want to live in peace with israel or who want to thrive and prosper because they do they they too deserve to live in dignity and final final question perhaps just a yes or no answer for now qatar friend or foe so Qatar is 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 a country uh, among the Arabs uh, among the uh, the Gulf Arab states, and there is great reconciliation happening. I hope that one day we see Qatar joins the Abraham Accords and recognize Israel. I know many people in Qatar 
um, even some royals, very open-minded, amazing people who view uh, the Jewish people as their cousins and neighbors. So I, I, I always love to keep an optimistic eye and say right. that hopefully it will change. JBS viewers, um, what are the right adjectives here? Visionary, forward-looking, optimistic, brave, intrepid, courageous. I think they all apply here to Loai Al-Sharif. This has been a very special 30 minutes. I thank you. I send best wishes for all of your efforts as a champion of the Arab peace movement. And I hope one day, as we say in Hebrew, alavai, as you say in Arabic, inshallah, that we will be able to celebrate the expansion of the Abraham Accords. Thank you for joining us. With the help of God, Be'ezrat Hashem. Thank you so much, uh, David. Thank you. Thank you, JBS viewers. See you next week.